The long and storied 4,000 year history of Chinese Kung Fu has an even more varied and complex history of different fighting styles, and the elegant flowing style of Tai Chi Chuan is but one of many. Sometimes dubbed shadow boxing, this style stands from a philosophy based on an ancient Chinese concept of dualism, or yin and yang. Modern orthodox styles of Tai Chi Chuan can be traced as far back as the 17th century based on five traditional schools, Chen, Yang, Wu Hao, Wu, and Sun. The Chen school having the most dominant influence. The essence of Tai Chi Chuan is to keep opposing forces flowing naturally and repelling brute force with softer, gentler actions, or vice versa. Why is this important? Because two forces of equal power only nullify the flow of yin and yang, so until one yields, the flow can't be achieved. But Tai Chi Chuan is more than just a martial art. It can also be used for stress management and for healthy exercise. In today's modern era, Tai Chi is commonly celebrated in a global event called World Tai Chi and Qigong Day, which debuted in 1999 and is still going to this very day. Today's episode will be focusing on a proud and privileged college student from a wealthy family whose life takes a dramatic turn at the age of 13 and motivates her to become a master of Tai Chi and slaying the unbeatable dragon that exists in her mind. As usual, the focus will be on the retcon dimension storyline, and based on the results of this poll by you, the viewers, the original story differences will be discussed after the first eight episodes of this ongoing series. Without further ado, this is the fourth episode of Dead or Alive or Explained, featuring the Tai Chi Chuan genius, Lei Fang. One of the original three female characters in the Dead or Alive series, Lei Fang is a young college student from China, born into a wealthy family, when it's the DOA tournament to find and defeat a familiar face on the past. With one of Dead or Alive's main gameplay features being universal defensive holds, the idea of a Tai Chi martial arts came naturally for Team Ninja. And to complement this, they had to create a personality to match, one so elegant and graceful that even in defeat, she would rise again like a beautiful phoenix. Hence her namesake, Lei Fang. Even in the early development stages of the first Dare Alive, Lei Fang was always described as having a very young appearance, with a slim, petite build of average height, dark brown eyes, pale skin, and a small face. However, compared to most of the cast of Dare Alive, she has gone through some dramatic changes. In the original, she was more tomboyish, having short hair tied back in a high ponytail, sporting street clothes, her black trousers and black shorts being the most iconic of that particular game. However, since Dead or Alive 2, she has traded the tomboyish attire for a much more feminine look, consisting of longer hair and a variety of hairstyles to boot. In addition to her longer hair, she wears a lot more formal Chinese attire decorated with patterns of birds and flowers, the most iconic of these being her red chung sum with high heels. Put on the red dress and slip on your high heels. In addition to having many hairstyles and possibly the most costumes out of the entire history of the cast, Lei Feng is also the first female to include glasses as part of her costume. Well, in the Friday Game series anyway. This change in overall attire is often speculated as a story-driven change that stemmed across her diva rivalry of sorts with Helena. Which leads us to the next topic of discussion, Lei Feng's personality. She's known to be very kind, intelligent, and has a very competitive spirit as a drive for self-improvement. Because of this, she is also prone to strong emotions and even stronger sense of pride and self-respect, bringing misery and woe to any who touch her inappropriately, even if it's by accident. Lei Feng also has a strong sense of justice and has zero tolerance for bullies and child trafficking. Lei Feng's take on the Chai Chi Chuan style is a hybrid of the Chen and Yang styles that was mentioned earlier in this video. As her skills evolved, Lei Feng's fine style expanded to having a wide range of defensive holds and even wider range of defensive appearance, even when attacked from behind. In addition to these, her signature Haisetsu Glow is a standout launching move that sometimes comes out of nowhere and is often discouraging her opponents from taking action after she performs a safe move. This technique is also known among the competitive DOA community as the shoulder. Lei Feng has many friendly rivalries with the cast of Dare Alive, including Helena Douglas, Tina Armstrong, and especially the young Japanese-German black belt karate, Hitomi, who she's been inseparable with 
for at least two years since Dare Alive 4. Gee, I'd sure like to know what's in that cabbage. With an incredibly large wardrobe of costumes, a meticulously defensive fighting style, and a positive attitude you can't help but find attractive. Lei Fang is not only one of the most iconic non-ninja characters in the Dare Alive series, but also one of the most iconic female characters since the first Dare Alive. Six years before the events of Dead or Alive, Lei Fang was a spunky 13-year-old who was still an apprentice of Chai Chi Chuan. One day, she was attacked by a group of thugs, and a boy no more than two years older than her fought them off, saving her life. Lei Fang thanked the boy for his help, but also expressed slight reprehension by adding that she could have handled the situation herself. And with that, the young boy disappeared. This incident would motivate Lei Fang to master her kung fu to the fullest and prove her independence to a boy who, in her mind, belittled her ability to defend herself. She would get that chance to prove herself to him six years later. In the first Dare Life tournament, Lei Fang plays a rather minor role in the story, but nonetheless is one of the few to make it fall alongside Kasumi, Ayane, Tina, and more importantly, the boy, now a man, who saved her life six years ago, known as Jan Lee. But when she finally got the opportunity to face Jan Lee, she was eliminated by him from the tournament. This didn't discourage her one bit, as she gracefully accepted that the only thing she could do was train harder for the next one. In the second Dare Life tournament, Lei Fang was among the many contestants aboard the Freedom Survivor attending a meeting gala held by the new founder of Doa Tech, Helena Douglas. Upon laying eyes on the woman, Lei Fang has an admiration for her, but is also slightly jealous that there is a diva with higher wealth and status than herself, let alone a diva who packs a punch. Like in the first tournament, she made it far enough to face Chen Li again, determined to be a part of his world. But unlike a certain Disney movie that remained nameless, some fairy tale endings just aren't meant to be. And the result was the same as before. <laughs> the results of the second Dare Life tournament gained Lei Fang significant notoriety and fame among martial arts enthusiasts despite her loss, and she became widely known as the young genius of Tai Chi Chuan. Despite the validation, Lei Fei never lost focus and was more fired up than ever to slay the dragon that dwells in her mind. Prior to the third tournament, Lei Fei crosses paths with Jan Lee at the Freedom Survivor, openly challenging him. Jan Lee declines and walks away coldly, which Lei Fei doesn't take kindly to. In her persistence, Jan Lee decides to be a total douche and tosses Lei Fei to a dining set telling her he has no time for weaklings. Jan Lee's behavior angers her tone, and she feels the urge to intervene, but Lei Fang firmly replies not to, insisting to keep the conflict between her and Jan Lee. Despite this, Jan Lee's attention turns to Hayate, whom he believes is an opponent worthy of his time. As the third Dare Life tournament is underway, Lei Fang will once again face Jan Lee, boasting that she would defeat the dragon within him, but alas, it's deja vu all over again. Despite her loss at the tournament, the progress she had made since the start of her journey would see some serious results. As some time after on the casual stroll in her hometown, Lei Fang would see a child in an alley until a suspicious looking van stops by with a gang of child trafficking thugs in tow attempting to take the child away. And you know how Lei Fang feels about that. I do not stand by in the presence of evil. <laughs> Lei 
Lei Fang makes quick work of the child traffic in Ma, as well as the leader, knocking them all unconscious. And afterward, Lei Fang playfully pokes at the child's nose, assuring him that he's safe. And in the events of Dare Life 3 from Lei Fang's perspective, Lei Feng once again enters the fourth Derelite tournament to, well, you know, but not without a few minor incidents. At a seaside market, Hitomi was out shopping to prepare a Japanese meal, and a head of cabbage from Muramasa, remember that old geezer from Ninja Gaiden, was just what she needed. <laughs> Muramasa was reluctant to make the sale, but when Lei Feng passed by, he sold the cabbage to her instead, which escalates to a fight. <laughs> Although Lei Feng lost and conceded the head of cabbage to Hitomi, the incident somehow brought the two together. Whether it's a common desire for improvement or being kindred spirits and love lone hearts, the two became inseparable. Well, she is. If I knew Cabbage was this powerful and brought people together, that would solve all the problems of the people in DOA. Especially if this all started because Victor Donovan was in love with Fane Douglas' wife. Hey Fane, there's something I gotta tell you. What is it, Vic? It's about... Oh, never mind. Don't worry, the good old Cabbage could loosen you up. Cabbage intensifies. So yeah, I really like Maria. Well, damn, dude. It's not like I don't have a lot of women to choose from. If you want the hookup, just ask. I'll just ask Miyakura or something. Thanks, now I don't have to kill you and look for ninjas. Eh? But reality is not so kind, sadly. Anyway, back to the story. On her way to the Tri Tower, Lei Feng would encounter an angry Bass Armstrong, who took a huge loss at the casino nearby, and has taken his frustrations out on the people nearby. Naturally, Lei Feng would not stand by and watch, and drew Bass's aggression towards her, defeating him and burning his anger. Inside the Tri Tower, and right in the middle of an all out war between Doatek and the Mugen Tension, no less, Lei Fang finally encounters Jan Lee, flirting with him at first. But Jan Lee doesn't catch on, and Lei Fang quickly shifts the conversation to a challenge right where they stand. As the tower was collapsing, Jan Lee asked if she was still serious about fighting him, and Lei Feng still consented. <laughs> Though it was not officially a tournament match, Lei Feng accomplished her goal and finally slayed the dragon that she had sought to defeat throughout the year of DOA tournaments. On her way back home, she took a train, and along the way, a phone would stop in the middle of the tracks, prompting the train to make an abrupt stop, disorienting many of the passengers, including Lei Fang, who stumbles backward, which breaks the buttons on her shirt, leaving her exposed. An old man in particular would stumble right in front of her, losing his balance and accidentally grabbing hold of Lei Fang's well-endowed assets. Despite being an accident, Lei Fang becomes very angry, and the old man has the unfortunate luck of facing the full fury of Lei Fang's Kung Fu, sending him flying out of the train, plummeting into the river below the bridge, thus sending the events of their life forward from Lei Fang's perspective. Hearing news about a fifth day away tournament two years later, Lei Fang reunites with Hitomi, and they set off on a journey to train. Among the notable places they go to train is a circus under construction, where they unexpectedly cross paths with the unlikely duo of Genfu student Elliot and Brad Wong, a drunken kung fu specialist. Soon after their meeting, Zack arrives at the circus in an unorthodox manner, sending an invitation for them to the 5th DOA tournament. <laughs> Thank you.
Itomi, focus. Don't move yet. Got a question for you ladies. Us. Ah! Get me out of here. Don't do drugs. If you're doing it, stop it. Get some help. Eventually, Lei Fang and Itomi travel to the jungles of South America and train nearby the ruins of the temple where they spot Zack again, this time with Jan Lee. Hey, see that? Yeah, I saw. He's done some serious training. We've got some catching up to do. Let's do it. Realizing that Jan Lee was all but confirmed to show up, Lei Fang was further motivated to do some serious sparring with the Tony. The two would then part ways, promising to meet again at the tournament. Lei Fang heads to New York a few days later, trailing Jan Li to a gym where a newcomer named Mila regularly trains. In her effort to further spy on Jan Li, she is cut off by Mila and decides to train with her instead. After their brief sparring, Lei Fang continues to follow Jan Li to a nearby train. And similarly to an incident from before, the train makes an abrupt stop, disorienting the passengers. Incidentally, the same old man Lei Fang met before stumbled her way again. But Jan Li manages to break his fall, stumbling on him instead. Jan Li then scolds Lei Fang, telling her it's not polite to spy on people, and that she should be more straightforward if she's looking for a fight, which Lei Fang more than obliges to. However, the train undergoes another problem much worse than an abrupt stop, and the train tilts off the rails, causing all the passengers to panic. In the aftermath of the disaster, Lei Fang is atop Jan Li in a suggestive position, leaving the two of them embarrassed. On the day of the tournament, Lei Fang and Jan Li would face each other again at the quarterfinals, the former still dwelling on the embarrassing incident of the train. Jan Li insists for her to pay it no mind and focus on the fight. Unfortunately for Lei Fang, her concentration was not enough to gain a tournament win on Jan Li and is eliminated, thus sending the events of their life fine from Lei Fang's perspective. As usual, Lei Fang continues her training back home for the next tournament, when suddenly a strange woman with giant feathered wings, the Neo Tengu, tries to draw her attention, offering her a chance to become stronger. Would you like to become even stronger? If you can beat me, I may just teach you something good. Oh really? I think I'm going to take you up on that. Lei Fang wins the fight, and Neo Tengu holds her into the bargain. Well, sort of. Actually. But you see, there's a reason. Huh? Someone with your strength might even. Huh? Based on the vague whispers of where Lei Fang decides to go to next, it's deduced that Neo Tango told her the secret to acquiring a greater strength lies in a sunken treasure ship. Not wanting to go alone, Lei Fang brings Hitomi along for the ride. Searching the sunken treasure ship, which Neo Tengu may or may not have given the details about. Discovering a rather sizable treasure chest, the two girls deduced that could be what they were looking for. In a deal made prior to searching for the treasure, the one who wins the match will be the one who keeps it. In the end, Lei Fang ends up keeping the treasure chest, but is quickly parted from it. Apparently, Neo Tengu failed to mention the existence of sea monsters, let alone those with giant tentacles. 
Having lost the treasure chest, Leifang and Tomi flee for their lives, jumping off the ship before the sea monster could crush them. Returning to China and hearing news about Jan Li getting exposure by the press, Leifang suspects that Jan Li had been acting strangely and neglecting his training, as being in the spotlight was never his style. To confirm her suspicions, Leifang confronts Jan Li directly, showing him the magazine he was exposed in, implying that he's been slacking. In an attempt to save his pride, Jan Li decides to fight Leifang, the latter being more confident than usual. However, upon defeating Jan Li, Leifang couldn't help but feel a sort of emptiness within Jan Li and expresses concern, but instead, Jan Li pushes her away, not wanting to tell her about his real problems. Before the tournament starts, Lei Feng strolls around an historic museum, paying tribute to the past locales of the DOA tournament, the classic Danger Zone in Monica. There, she meets the juvenile duo of Hanukkah and Marie Rose, who are taken aback at the stage's design. Lei Feng warns them not to get too curious, as certain parts of the floor explode, as she swiftly demonstrates. That floor explodes, you know. While the outcome of the fight is never explained, what we do know is that Lei Fang confronts Jan Li in the tournament once more. No shit. Lei Fang is overflowing with confidence this time around, certain that she would finally get a tournament win over Jan Li, even if he had the result to participate. But you know how the story goes by now. Jan Li advances to the semifinals. No shit. But this time around, the loss didn't even matter to Lei Fang that much. What was important to her was that Jan Lee kept up his training and that she lost fair and square. Despite this, Jan Lee was still occupied with something else on his mind, thus ending the events of Dare Alive 6 from Lei Fang's perspective. Before we get to my final thoughts on Lei Fang's story and character development, we have a bonus chapter in this video that applies to a select few characters. Bonus story trivia, if you will. In Dead or Alive 6, if you take the time to browse the library in the DOA Central option of the main menu, you'll stumble across the subsections Encyclopedia and Trivia. The former describes in detail most, if not all, the basic lore of the DOA series, while the latter has minor story skits that help to expand on the DOA 6 story, some significantly more than others. Obviously, we'll be talking about the ones relevant to Leifang. In one skit, Lei Fang is making preparations for Valentine's Day, and by now it's obvious that she has feelings for Jan Lee, but there's one problem. She has no idea what kind of food he likes. So, she decides to wrap up some chocolates, asking Itomi if she plans to do the same. Lei Fang then offers to help Itomi make them together, and later gives the chocolates to Jan Lee. However, upon meeting Diego, Jan Lee gives the box of chocolates to him, as he doesn't like sweets. In another skit, Lei Fang appears to be writing a challenge letter to Jan Lee asking him to meet her at 8 p.m. in two days at a local shop. Hitomi takes a look at it and assumes it's a love letter. Embarrassed, Lei Fang decides not to send it. While it isn't much to go on, we can definitely confirm Lei Fang thinks that Jan Lee is more than just a rival. And while it is a slow burn, it should be interesting to see where the next sequel will go from there. That being said, I gotta be honest, if it weren't for the brilliant move to shake up Lei Fang's story by forming a friendship with Atomi, who was also in the friend zone, her backstory wouldn't be anything special. Seriously, you can only repeat his backstory about a female college student going after the same guy in a tournament so many times before it gets old and stale. And now you suddenly want to take it in a romantic direction? We barely got a reason to give a damn about Jan Lee's character as it is. And please don't tell me a backstory about a guy who only found meaning in the world by becoming stronger than everyone else makes him a good character. Because that awful story works so well for Jiren in Dragon Ball Super, right? Jan Lee needs actual stakes in his backstory. And Lei Fang's concern about his attitude after Daryl Live 5 
as well as Jan Lee's Will They or Won't They Bromance with Rig is the perfect setup to plant the seeds necessary to evolve the Lei Fang's story. Yes, I said bromance. Seriously, did you really, I mean really, take a closer look at Jan Lee's face? Seriously, look at that shit. His face just screams out thirsty. Jan Lee so wants to tap that ass. Anyway, on a serious note, if Jan Lee follows Rig down the rabbit hole far enough, why not let it lead him to discover an uncomfortable truth about his past, such as the truth about how he became an orphan or lost his parents? But the twist is that the records he found were tied to Doatek, and Rig manipulates him to join Miss to get his revenge on Doatek, who was so-called responsible for their deaths. This would get Lei Fang directly involved with the main plot, as Jan Lee could potentially sell his soul to evil, only to get revenge on the wrong people. And given that he's won two consecutive DOA tournaments in a row, he could be an even more dangerous foe if he became part of Mist, whether by force or by choice. These struggles would make Lei Fang's growing relationship with Jan Lee feel a lot more rewarding, if Jan Lee lives long enough to see through Mist's lies, that is. Other than that, I don't see any other ways they can improve on her backstory. She's on friendly terms with most people, wealthy, resourceful, and did I mention that the writers getting her to become best friends with Itomi after DOA 4 was brilliant? The only missing ingredient with her is that she needs a little shakeup that gets her directly involved with the main plot, and her real trial by fire will begin. But trials mean nothing to Lei Fang, because no matter how many times she crashes and burns, in the face of injustice or even a challenge, she will always gracefully rise from the ashes like a beautiful phoenix. Winner! That wraps up this episode of Daryl Live Lore Explained. Tune in next time for the backstory of Lei Fang's strongest rival, Jan Lee, a scorching soul who rose from a hellish past as an orphan to a brighter future as a fighter and bouncer by awakening the dragon within him. A dragon that would inspire all who face him. I'm Osmic. And I hope you look forward to getting a glass of water next time. Happy listening.